here to listen to this uh, wonderful lecture. And uh, similarly, I extend a warm welcome uh, to uh, Professor Praveen Kumar and all the uh, other uh, invitees of this uh, webinar. So to give a brief background, Professor Praveen Kumar is uh, from IIT Kanpur, mechanical engineer. So maybe I should just, uh, you know, uh, raise a flag for myself from mechanical engineering. And he received his master's and PhD from the University of Southern California, Los Angeles in uh, USA. He is currently in the Department of Materials Engineering, IASC. And his main interests are in the mechanical behavior of materials with the emphasis on studying the effects of electric current, temperature, and sample length scale, and constructive usage of electro migration, both in solid and liquid metals. I think if I remember right, there are people who also want to use the electric uh, field for the metal farming. So I think this has a lot of uh, you know advantages. So without uh, taking too much of your time, I think I'll now request Professor Praveen Kumar to deliver his lecture. And uh, I would request the audience to raise their questions through the chat box, which will be addressed at the end of the talk in a sequential manner. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Raghu Prakash, uh, for the kind introduction and, and also inviting uh, me to uh, give this lecture, give this talk. And uh, this, 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 this work, uh, you know, the, the, the things that I'm going to discuss today, uh, the, the, the work, all the work has been done by uh, three of my students. Uh, Deepak, he was the first, he was the first PhD student in my group to start working on it. Now he is in, uh, he is an uh, assistant professor in JNU. Then Subham Jain, he is an MTech student. Uh, now he, he did work and now he's in applied materials. And Swanand, he is a PhD student currently working on this. And so, so this is basically the, you know, the contribution from these three students. The funding for the work came from uh, CSIR uh, earlier, and now DST is uh, supporting some of this work. Uh, so basically, uh, as Professor Raghu Prakash mentioned, uh, looking at the mechanical behavior in presence of electric field is something that has been going on for for very long time, right? Uh, and 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 we uh, stumbled upon this area uh, with with you know uh, kind of. Uh, it was an interesting uh, story. We were looking at at that time. We were looking at the uh, you know electro migration or the effect of electric current on you know the uh, migration or the motion of the atoms or vacancies in a thin films. Uh, and one of the films that we made was not really perfect. It has some edge, you know, uh, you know edge edge crack. And then what happened that when we looked at the samples, uh, we start we saw that. Whatever flaw was there on the, at the edge, it just started to grow, and it just has to grow deeper and deeper. Uh, so that's that's basically how uh, I got into this 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 field of looking at what happens when we pass electric current in a in a, in a foil or in a film or in a material which has a pre crack. So that's that's basically is the is is is, is the starting. And uh, and 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 essentially, if you look at uh, uh, what really is happening when we are passing electric current uh, through a foil or through a film which has a crack. Uh, this is just a small, simple schematic. And what we see here is that as the current passes through uh, across this crack, uh, we have, a, you know, in some sense, if we imagine this as multiple conductors, right, then essentially we can think of uh, conductors uh, sitting next to each other and they are passing current in the opposite directions. Now we know from the very basic physics that if we if we have two conductors, you know, two parallel conductors, and they are, you know, they are passing current in the opposite direction, there will be repulsive force between them. And if we look at it in this context of a crack, then essentially what we are looking at is that two faces of the crack are actually repelling each other, and and that essentially then leads to uh, you know mode one kind of loading on 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 the crack, right? And uh, this is one configuration. The other configuration can be where the current is just passing from one end to another end, and the crack is just here uh, in, in perpendicular to that. There also we will have the similar effects. Of course, it will not be as you know severe as this case, but there also we will see the same situation: the current uh, changing their direction across the crack. There is also going to be current crowding at the tip, 
Am I right? That essentially will lead to uh, you know large or concentrated joule heating here. Now this has interesting effect uh, in two ways. First of all, there will be current, there will be temperature that will be higher at this crack tip. And as we go away from the crack tip, the temperature will be lower. So there will be a temperature gradient that will be established. And, and in, a, in a metal, in, in a, which is going to expand because of the heating, uh, this will lead to a compressive stresses at the crack tip because this is hotter, this wants to expand more, whereas this, this part doesn't want to expand in the same amount. So there will be some sort of a compressive stresses that will be built in here. So we have a system where we are looking at uh, tensile stresses which are trying to open up the crack. Then there is a compressive stresses at the crack tip because of the thermal uh, because of the thermal temperature gradient, and the material near the crack tip is sitting at very high temperature. So so this is what we are looking at. This is the whole system. And uh, and again, uh, this is not the something uh, for the first time we will look looking at it. This is this has been done, uh, you know, for, from the ages. Especially the people who were interested in looking at the rail guns, uh, they have been interested in this kind of problem for for a very long time. So this is one picture from uh, Professor K. Ravichandar's group in uh, in in the UT Austin. And what you see here is a crack in a steel. And as as they are passing these pulses, the material near the near the notch actually melts and then it is thrown away uh, by the by the current again this is aluminum alloy and and we will you know you see this successively right and this is a very violent process actually if you look at it uh, all the material whatever was there got molten and was thrown away and this process is called uh, you know magnetic saw effect and this is a major issue in the reliability of the rail guns and 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 we see this right so now if we are interested in looking at uh, you know uh, let's say some sort of a clean fracture or or clean propagation of the crack at the at the at the, at the crack tip by passes of the electric current uh, then we have to avoid you know this 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 excessive heating and melting at the tip right and 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 we we wonder if that's even how is it possible and what can we do and and that's 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 was one of the problems that Deepak was interested, in, and we were we were working on that. So so we we looked at what is really going on uh, in sequence sequence process. So we pass the current, electromagnetic force is generated almost instantaneously. That then essentially opens the crack in mode one. Right? This is instantaneous. This happens as soon as we pass the current. And the second thing is of course the joule heating uh, continues, but the joule heating as we wait longer. I'm right. There will be more heat that will be generated. The temperature will go higher and higher. So we think that this is this this process of of excessive joule heating leading to the melting and then of course the blowing the the whole material gets blown away away because of electromagnetic force. It is actually a time dependent process. It will be more severe if we pass the current for longer time, right? So so if we want to have avoid this 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 you know this this rather violent process of magnetic saw effect, then we should try to uh, you know, pass the current or the pulse, which which kind of which is a very short pulse, which which kind of avoids this whole thing together. And we we can just then look at only this instantaneous process. So that was the that was that 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 thought process went on. And then we thought it okay, let's let's look into this. And uh, and if this is the case, then of course, you know, we 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 have to come up with a term something like equivalent to a stress intensity factor for this purpose also. Uh, so then these are the equations that we need to solve. And if you look at these equations, these are not very actually these are all uh, very simple equations that we have gone through in our high schools. The first these first four equations are basically, you know, your Gauss Gauss equations Gauss equations for you know. Magnetic field, Ampere's law, and, and Faraday's law, which we can put them together, what we call it as a Maxwell equation. And these are written for the time-dependent process. And this will become a little bit clearer as we will as we will look into that, as we look into the experimental setup. This is your classical Lorentz force equation. And then this is the uh, you know uh, the force or the equation of equilibrium for the solid state, uh, solid mechanics uh, issue. So these are the uh, main equations that we need to solve. And then there are, these are the constitutive equations relating electric field with the current density and magnetic field with the with 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 with, uh, with the magnetic intensity factor, uh, magnetic intensity. And then these are the boundary conditions that that we have to look at. And 
we used COMSOL multiphysics to solve actually all these problems in a sequential fashion using these uh, three, uh, you know, uh, physics interfaces that it has. Uh, and one of the things that we have done here, and we are solving the solid mechanics problem, is that we we use the linear elasticity model. And of course, uh, this question always remains there: that is it reasonable? Can we still use linear elasticity to solve these problems? And we will see uh, there are some suggestions uh, based on our results. It looks like uh, the time, uh, the process, the, the time is so short in all of these things that perhaps there's not much plasticity going on uh, in the material. So we will we will we will see those things and then we can discuss whether this is this is any good or not good at all. Uh, and this is the boundary conditions. This is the what we are passing a pulse. This is the time and this is the current. This time from here to here is, you know, can be anywhere from 50 microseconds to a few uh, hundreds of milliseconds and, and different work that we did actually involved different uh, different time scale. For the fracture work, we, we generally had this one very short, about 50 microseconds, and uh, maximum was about 500 microseconds or 0.5 milliseconds. And later on, I will show you some results where we actually went on for uh, much longer time durations. So this is a simple, uh, you know, uh, this is exactly is very similar to what we had as a sample. This is the FEM model that we right, that I'm showing you here, and we did the basic idea of you know how to refine the mess and when when to stop. Those things were 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 done, and here is here are some interesting results that come from the FEM, which are again intuitive. It's not very uh, non-intuitive. So the so this is uh, what happens when we are looking at the when we have passed the pulse and we are looking at very early on. So this is about what happens after 10 nanoseconds, right? Uh, and this is the applied current density, and this is the induced current density because, you know, as we are passing the current using this uh, square wave, uh, in the beginning, the current or the electric field is changing very rapidly. That will then lead to a very rapid ri rise or change in the magnetic magnetic field, which will then again induce the eddy currents, right? So, so this is all your uh, our eddy currents, which is coming in response to a very change in the very rapid change in the electric field uh, because we are passing the uh, we are passing the square wave. Uh, sorry, and uh, eventually after about six milliseconds or so, uh, we we reach a steady state. The change in the uh, electric field is not there anymore, and then we have this uh, you know the electric field lines establishes like that. The current density, of course, as we expected, there's very high current con concentration at the notch tip, and, and that is this is all is uh, is 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 uh, something that we can uh, we can expect. And we can see here the current actually reverses along the you know around the around the crack tip, and that is essential for applying you know opening uh, crack opening stress on the on on, on this on this notch. Then this is about how the magnetic field evolves with time. Uh, in the beginning, there is not much magnetic field because effectively the current is not much. And then the current, then the you know the magnetic field starts to build up. This is about 50 microseconds. This is about 10 milliseconds, which is in a steady state. And again, we can see that uh, across the crack tip, the magnetic field is of the opposite direction of the crack, and hence they will repel. And they will repel, so that means this is again the electromagnetic force lines, the the the, the Lorentz force, and you can see that it is kind of trying to open the crack in in, in or or hence uh, the crack can grow. Uh, this is a stress evolution again in sigma y y, which is along the vertical direction, and you can see that there is a stress concentration here at the crack tip, which actually gives the sense of the same kind of kidney bean kind of shape, which is what we are very familiar with when we apply a mechanical load. Uh, and again, we, if we look at, uh, this is a long, long scale, uh, the stress sigma y by variation as a function of distance away from the crack tip uh, here along this the, along this line. Uh, and we see that up to a certain distance, uh, about 25% of the crack length, original crack length, uh, this this decrease in the, in the stress is actually a uh, square root, which is again very similar to, <clears throat> similar to when we apply a mechanical load. So, so in some sense, this resembles uh, like like the case when we apply a mechanical stress, and then perhaps we can think of uh, defining some sort of a stress intensity factor also for this particular problem, which can then be used 
to to examine whether the fracture will take place or not. Uh, to calculate this uh, stress intensity factor, we went ahead and we get got calculated the J integral. And here, what we have to remember is that the the Lorentz force is essentially a body force because it is acting at each and every point in the body. And only when we take cons consider this as a body force, then only we essentially we start to see that the J integral becomes path independent, right? Which is again another good good thing about about this particular loading, which again gives us you know. Uh, a way to correlate these results with with what happens when we apply a mechanical load. And then again, we can go ahead and we can calculate the stress intensity factor. Again, we are always we are assuming the linear elasticity. Uh, and and this is actually what happens with time, uh, how this stress intensity factor evolves with time. And in the beginning, you please remember that we have large amount of eddy current. And and that's why we don't we don't have much of the magnetic field and hence the electromagnetic forces. Your our stress intensity factor is smaller. And then eventually, once we have the steady state, when 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 there is no change in the electric field anymore, then we start to see, you know, a saturation in the stress intensity factor. So so we can calculate the stress intensity factor or J integral at any time using our uh, our software. And and what we did also was for this particular foil that I will be showing you the experiments that we did. We did a standard uh, mechanical test on these aluminum foils, which was about 11, 11 micrometer thick. And we got a sense that maybe this stress intensity factor, uh, critical stress intensity factor at which the fracture can take place is about 8.6 uh, MPa square meter. Uh, uh, sorry, square root meter. Uh, and 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 so so in in, in later on uh, whenever there is a crack propagation i will be comparing the this the stress intensity factor because of the electric current pulse with this number and and if this and we will then see whether the crack can grow or not so that's that's basically is is that's where this number comes in handy so this is a setup what deepak built uh, some time ago and what we see here is this is a sample holder. The sample goes in here. You can see the sample. And then we have these two uh, uh, you know, crocodile clips through which we can pass the current. Uh, we apply a mechanical load. Uh, it will become a little bit clearer why we are applying the mechanical load. But we did experiments without mechanical load also. But this setup allows us to apply mechanical load also. Uh, but but uh, the initial experiment that I will show you were without mechanical load. Uh, uh, and this is a load cell if you are applying the mechanical load. This container is is made of, of aluminum, and this has actually a very important role because a lot of our experiments we did, uh, we we had to fill the whole container with liquid nitrogen so that we can keep the temperature of the sample uh, low. Uh, if you don't put this liquid nitrogen, then then we will see there are some interesting effects that happens on the on the film simply because the temperature is very high. Uh, these are electrical connections. Then, of course, we want to see as we do the experiments. We have an optical microscope. This is our, you know, sample, which is 99% pure, about 12 micrometer thick aluminum foil. We create the notch just by using the razor, and this is our notch that we have. And this is how the setup, the whole setup, looks like. This is the power source, and then we have, uh, you know, oscilloscope so that we can measure exactly what current has been has been passed. So these are the two pulses that we used at that time. This is a square pulse. Uh, the maximum current can go through is one kilo amperes. The other one that we found in one of our uh, colleagues, Dr. Subaredi, who is in the high in, high voltage uh, uh, engineering, he had one very interesting uh, uh, power source, which can actually pass the pulse of about 50 microseconds, and the maximum current can go up to about 67, uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, this would be seven kilo amperes. Uh, that much of pulse we, we can pass there. So these are the first of the experiments. Uh, this is the current density, and when I'm talking about the current density, this is the nominal current density uh, that we can calculate by dividing the uh, the, the 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 current by the by the cross sectional area of this uh, you know of the of the film. Not here, so the current density at the crack tip will be very high, and the initial crack length by width ratio is 0.5. And we did this experiment with liquid nitrogen. And what we see after 100 pulses that this was our original notch, and we start to see some propagation of the crack. And if we pass, uh, if we again look at, uh, you know, our stress intensity 
sorry, uh, yeah, a stress intensity factor that we have calculated in the dynamic range, and it looks like it is higher than what what is required for the for the fracture of of this film. And I, again, we can continue to go ahead with 200 pulses, and the crack becomes longer. Please remember that this is 50 micrometer length scale, whereas this is 10 micrometer. So the crack just continues to propagate as we pass the pulse for longer and longer time. Uh, we looked at also the effect of current density, and again, we see the same thing. If we increase the current density, right, there is an increase in the stress intensity factor, and we see a little longer crack growth. But in none of these cases, we see any catastrophic fracture. Uh, the crack just grows by a certain amount, and then it just, you know, every pulse. So there's nothing like, you know, what we see in the mechanical load that the crack sometimes become unstable. Here, everything is growing uh, quite uh, stably. Uh, then this is one experiment that we did where we didn't use liquid nitrogen. So that is at a room at, at ambient temperature. And we see, again, this is something that we can take pictures with our microscope because there was no liquid nitrogen. So this was the original crack. Then 100, micro, 100 pulses grows by this. 200 pulses, it grows even longer, right? And, and this rate at which this crack is growing is much, much faster when we were, uh, uh, as opposed to when we were doing these experiments with liquid nitrogen. And again, you know, we see, uh, you know, that the crack grows uh, when essentially we found that the, the, the stress intensity factor that we had uh, was actually smaller than this. Uh, for the crack propagation, but then we think that this is happening because the temperature now is very high. So essentially, this K1C is is which is okay for the ambient temperature, the room temperature, may not be uh, valid at lower at 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 higher temperatures. And this we can make sense if we just still we continue to consider linear elasticity, which is again I think it is doubtful. But if you just look at the effect of uh, temperature on the Young's modulus. Uh, we will, we will make a sense of it, and we will see that the K1C will decrease as we increase the temperature. But, but this is again something that we have to, uh, we have to fully understand and appreciate. Uh, this is the again the crack, and one interesting thing that we see here is that, uh, you know, there's a large amount of region which has kind of, you know, affected because of this plasticity. This may be because of the increase in the temperature. And of course, uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, the plastic zone size is, 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 is now there. But again, please remember that this, these numbers are about 40 micrometers, this, this whole width. So on each side, it is growing about maybe 15 to 20 micrometers. So this is not, uh, uh, this is there, but it's again, we can, we, can, we can discuss about it, how important or how big it is uh, to affect our calculations. Now we can come back to this question that we saw that the crack here in, in our samples grew even at room temperature. It grew fairly, uh, you know, uh, you know, smoothly uh, without much of the, you know, the blowhole formation. Then we can ask this question, why do we form these blowholes? Uh, this is from the from, from the Professor K. Ravichandar's work that I showed you in the beginning. And, and what we did was, in this case, we just continued to, uh, you know, do these experiments that what I showed you earlier for a much longer uh, length, right? So this is without liquid nitrogen. And as we continue the crack growth, when the crack becomes long, then we start to see these blowholes to form, right? As you can clearly see from these pictures. And as the blowholes form, this is actually at higher current density. In higher current density, the blowholes form right from the beginning and their size keeps on increasing, right? So this resembles what we see here, right? So in some sense, what we think is that the blowholes will form if we start with a very long crack, Right, or we start doing this experiment at very high current densities. So, so we can, in that sense, we 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 can put our results or our work in context of uh, the blowhole formations that has been, you know, or magnetic soil effect that has been reported earlier. Right, of course, we can see here as you know this this zone keeps on increasing, right, uh, because as the crack length becomes bigger, the the heat affected zone or up to where you know, we can see all these wrinkles. Uh, unfortunately, these are so thin foils that we have not been able to do any meaningful microstructural analysis on this other than what picture I'm showing you, uh, which is something that Swanand now is trying to do. And hopefully we will have a better understanding of what is really going on in these regions, uh, uh, maybe in a couple of months. 
So this becomes a, uh, as I mentioned, this becomes an issue of let's say this heat, heat and temperature. Uh, and and the obvious question is that how can we minimize it? What can we do to uh, reduce it? And 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 we understand that the heat that is or the or the reason over which you know the temperature is higher uh, is 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 contributed by just the current, electric current. That's that. This is some based on our our FEM analysis that we did on the on defining a heat affected zone or a reason over which the temperature is higher than a critical number. So we get this kind of an equation and we see that it's a very strong function of essentially applied current density. So we think that if we can reduce this current density by some means, then essentially the we can reduce the, the spread of the temperature uh, and, and hence we can have a little bit more or, or little you know more uh, or, or cleaner uh, proportion of the crack. And 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 how can we do that? Is how can we reduce the J? It's a very simple way we can reduce the J if you can have some additional stimulus. For example, if you can apply an additional external magnetic field which can augment the magnetic field that is produced because of the electric current, or if you can apply a mechanical load, right? Both of these cases will will perhaps reduce the need for the J, the current density. So in the first set of experiments, uh, 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 Swanand and 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 and, uh, and Subham Subham Jain, what they did was they looked at the effect of magnetic field on on this on this crack propagation. So this is this setup uh, was the standard one that we have been using, and then we put this whole sample in between uh, this electromagnet, and this was this magnet could give us uh, a magnetic field of about from you know up to one tesla. And then we did these experiments, and what we see here is that as we pass, as we apply larger current, larger larger magnetic field, uh, you know, you can see from looking at these two images, right? Here, there's a lot of things happening around the crack as the crack is propagating at zero tesla, and not the same amount of things is happening when it is passing through 0.6 tesla. And this is this is just a very small change in the current density, but this has such kind of an such kind of an impact on on how much. Uh, you know the the how much uh, heat is it, heat is spread, and and this graph actually shows how the magnetic field as we increase the magnetic field reduces the requirement of you know the critical uh, current current density, and this goes down by linearly. And from this picture, we can again see that even though this decrease is very little, uh, just a few percentages, but at least to a, a a good decrease in the heat affected zone, and that because the spread of the heat affected zone goes as J square or the current density square. Uh, then the next thing is that we can also effect reduce this heat affected zone by applying the mechanical load. And that means now we are going to look at the coupling between the mechanical load and the and the electric current itself. And these are some simple uh, FEM analysis. And what we see in this FEM analysis, the simple FEM analysis of when we are just applying the electric current when we are applying the mechanical load only and when we are doing the both uh, electric current and mechanical load and in these processes if we calculate the stress intensity factors then essentially it looks like we can just simply linearly add them so it looks like we can linearly superimpose uh, you know the effect of mechanical load and uh, and and that of the electrical current to get the combined effect or combined stress intensity factor so in this case, we did this uh, experiment. Uh, uh, let me uh, see uh, so I can show you. So these are the these are the video of an experiment that uh, uh, I, Deepak took, and you can see that the crack is propagating. Here the, we have applied a mechanical load of about 11 MPa. Again, a far field mechanical mechanical stress, and the stress intensity factor because of the mechanical load is this much, whereas the stress intensity factor because of the applied electric current is about six. So if we add them together, they are higher than the critical stress intensity factor, and we can see that the crack is growing. I'll just expedite this video so that you can see. So crack has actually grown. So uh, and this is a picture that we have after the after the crack propagation, and you can see it's a very clean, clear fracture, as you can see from this picture again. This is this experiment was done at room temperature, right, without liquid nitrogen, and if we Compare these pictures with whatever we saw uh, when we were just passing the electric current. This thing was, uh, you know, uh, not that clean. It has a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, you know, the the wrinkles or the plasticity. 
effects at the at the tip here. This this thing is very very sharp. Uh, so so this is good. We we don't have blowholes, and but here actually what happens is that once the crack becomes very long, then essentially the stress intensity factor because of the mechanical load exceeds the critical stress intensity factor, and we have then catastrophic or instantaneous fracture, which was not there when we were just passing the electric current. And here is a way to see how the mechanical load can affect the critical stress, critical current that is required uh, for the crack to grow. And what you see here is the this FEM is here. The, the triangles are, are FEM and the experimental data is, is all the circles. And we see a very close match between them. And again, please remember that all this analysis that we have done, we have assumed linear elastic uh, elasticity. So, so the match is really nice. And this is an effect of you know the crack uh, length, as again JC, and we see that there is a you know there is a very uh, you know dramatic effect of, of of the crack length also when when we are applying the mechanical stress, and 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 so this is this is this is nice. We understand some of this that we can predict things from FEM, uh, and and we can see those same things in the experiments. Then the another thing that we were then got interested in uh, is. What will happen if I apply the mechanical load at an angle? For example, this is I'm applying. Let's say we are applying at about 45 degrees, and these are experiment. All of these experiments were done without without liquid nitrogen. See, these are all room temperature, and then you know the crack deflects, and this is something that uh, what uh, you know what uh, uh, Professor Vikram Jaram keeps uh, you know shows in his class. You know, classical experiments where you apply the stress at an angle. Uh, you know the cracks deflects, and that's what we are seeing here. So we apply a load at 45 degrees. The deflection is about 42 degrees, and and the and the and the and the you know the edges are all sharp. And again, if we continue to pass more pulses, this crack just continues to grow uh, without you know without any blowhole formation. So this is this is this is this is what is happening, and then we can go ahead again all linear elastic calculations. Uh, this is a simple, you know, if you have a mo mixed mode, uh, then what is the stress intensity factor, K effective? We can calculate this. The K1 uh, has getting contribution from both electric field, electric current, and the mechanical load, whereas the K2 has just the contribution from the uh, from the mechanical load because uh, the stress intensity factor because of the electric current is always in mode 1. And, and if we look at what is the effective you know, a stress intensity factor, it comes to be a number which is greater than the critical stress intensity factor that we require for the crack to grow. From these things, we can also get the sense of what should be the theta uh, at which the cracks would deflect uh, in such kind of loading. And if we do these calculations, what we get is about 40 degrees. And in the experiments, we have observed about 42 degrees. So this, this matches really well. Then we did these experiments at different uh, 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 different load at which we different angle at which we applied the mechanical load, and these are some of those pictures that you can see here. And what we observe in the experiments are these numbers, and what we predict from these linear elastic things are, are written at the bottom. And you can see there is a very close match between what we predict and what we see. Now this is very interesting because this gives us an idea of you know deflecting the crack by a certain by a certain angle. Now, if it can continue to deflect this crack at a certain angle, and I can I can proceed with this 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 cutting in some sense cutting process, then then we have a machining tool which can be which can be good for the you know uh, cutting these foils and and uh, by by a, by a means. So this is where uh, Swanand uh, developed this nice uh, uh, setup, and he's still working on it to get some more results. Uh, so, so he built this uh, very, uh, you know, uh, kind of very nice uh, setup, which actually allows us to put the sample here and apply a mechanical load at an angle, right? So we can, uh, this thing can move in this groove, and and then we have, uh, you know, actuator here, which we can apply a given load, and there is a, there is a, at the bottom there is a rotor uh, which can rotate actually this thing. Uh, this is what you see when this rotates. This this whole thing rotates, and then we can apply the load on the foil at an angle, and we can also pass the current. So this is basically the setup, and 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 you know these are some of the uh, things that you can see. How does it look at different angles? Now I can play this video 
and and you can see as 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 how the crack actually moves uh, with change in these angles. And now these all these things are automated, so I can uh, Swanand can change these angles at, for any arbitrary angle with just a press of a button, and and he can he can make the crack grow. So you can see this, uh, and and this is this is how it looks. So he has now he has now gained the ability to you know almost move this 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 crack in a sinusoidal fashion. So he has a very because the 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 equations work. Uh, the linear elastic equations essentially are working here to to make the you know to to for us to fully understand where the where the crack should grow. And these are all the basic steps that he has taken, right? The parameters that he has to play with is mechanical load, of course. So he has applied different mechanical loads. Uh, angle at which the mechanical load is applied, because this gives you the deflection. And the current pulse, again, both magnitude as well as for, the, for how long is going to apply the apply the mechanical, uh, the, the current pulse width. And using that, these three uh, parameters, uh, you know, as you can see, uh, the number of pulses as it grows, it it goes into a sinusoidal fashion. So, so this is some of his initial results that he has got from his machine. Uh, now, I will change the, uh, the topic slightly, and we will look into the second part of my uh, of 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 the of the title that 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 I had. That can we close the crack? Can we heal the crack? And some of the initial insights came from finite element analysis. And and let's look at these two these two uh, pictures. Uh, this is FEM uh, you know uh, simulation results. So what we see here is uh, what happens to the temperature gradient as it, as we wait longer. So this is 50 microseconds. This is 500 microseconds, and then corresponding stress field that we have. Now if you look at this at 50 microseconds, uh, the stress the temperature here is very high, and the spread of the zone of high temperature is rather limited as opposed to 500 microseconds and how does it reflect into the stresses so we see here the stress profile uh, again this 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 the crack face is actually under tensile stress uh, at the tip of again also we have very high tensile stress but there is a compressive stress uh, that builds up very near the crack tip and that zone of compressive stress actually increases as we wait long so so what it, what it suggests is that there is now you know as, as earlier I said that we have an interplay between the compressive stresses and tensile stresses. But what is happening with time is that uh, as we wait longer, the, 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 the spread of the compressive stress and also the magnitude of the compressive stress, as you can see here, uh, the maximum compressive stress is minus 10 to power 7 here. That goes up to 10 to power 8 here. Uh, so so, so, the, so the, the amount of the, the, the intensity of compressive stresses actually increases if we wait uh, longer. So, 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 in some sense, if we can think about that, if we wait very long, then perhaps the compressive stresses can dominate the tensile stresses. Uh, re remember, there is, there is still is a tensile stress acting on the crack phase. So then we uh, looked at uh, uh, you know some very simple uh, analysis about how does this thermal stress, which is compressive stress, uh, the ratio of the thermal stress compressive stress. Changes with the you know uh, and the and the, with the sorry the the ratio of the thermal stress which is compressive to the to the electromagnetic stress which is tensile how does it change uh, with different parameters so for example uh, applied current we don't see any change much change uh, with the uh, by the way these these numbers this ratio that we are looking at is actually at a point very close to the crack tip right so this is not a representative of the entire body but this is just to get a Get a feel of it. What is really happening? And but interestingly, if we see the effect of the pulse width, right? As we rather than passing 50 microsecond, if we choose a pulse which is of longer uh, width, then essentially we see a rapid increase uh, in in these compressive stresses. Uh, again, how does the crack width changes? Uh, 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 crack length changes this uh, this this thing. And what we see is that as the crack is smaller, uh, you know. We have, you know, again, the compressive stresses will be very, very high. And so, so, and then one more in thing, what we see here, this is actually just the, the magnitude of the compressive stresses itself, uh, normalized with the shear stress. And what we see here, this is a stainless steel, and this is for aluminum. And what we see is that if we use a stainless steel, 
uh, which is more resistive material, then essentially we can increase these compressive stresses by a large amount while we are also increasing the temperature. So if you want to have large compressive stresses, relatively large compressive stresses, then we need to choose uh, pulses with uh, you know high pulse width. We have to choose uh, cracks which are shorter, and we have to do these experiments and on a material which has higher electrical resistivity. And because we are working with the metals, that also translates itself into higher uh, thermal resistivity, which is again important for creating the temperature gradient. So we now onward, we from this understanding, we thought that okay, perhaps uh, we can get a condition where the crack can close rather than grow. And 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 to do that, we we thought that okay, we have to now change our material from aluminum uh, to actually a stainless steel. So so the experiment that I will show you later on, they're all done on done on a stainless steel. And again, the finite element analysis was done using Comsol, and all the same modules that I discussed earlier were used. I'm right in a sequence, and this is our sample geometry. Now, this sample geometry is actually it's a CTS specimen where Swanand has been able to get the fatigue crack that we see here. I'm right, so the same thing was modeled in 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 the in the in the in the Comsol, and 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 the pulse width that he is passing, the pulses that he is passing. Was 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 an input. Here the pulse is. You can, you can see this is a sinusoidal pulse. This is not the square pulse that we have been using earlier. And these are some of the interesting results. So what we see here is that uh, this is actually what you see here is that everything is moving to the left, right? The the current density, the tip of the current density, the compressive stresses is all moving to the left because what is happening is that once we pass this pulse the crack faces are getting closed, right? So that's the plastic strain that we can see here. So the plastic strain is leading to the closure of the crack. And because the crack closes, the next time when the current has to reverse, actually it thinks that the crack tip has actually gone to the left, right? So this, this part is in some sense is, is plastically, uh, you know, uh, plastically deformed so much that it is touching each other. And because of that, the current density, that the maximum current density goes to the left. That means effectively the crack is closing. And similarly, everything else kind of follows through. Uh, so the compressive stresses become very high, closes the crack, and 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 so on. So so the FEM solution simulations uh, suggest that uh, perhaps we will have large enough compressive stresses to close the crack. Right. Once the crack is closed, and still we have compressive stresses, the temperature is high. Maybe we can close the crack. So this was, um, you know, a good news for us. And then we did the experiments. So this is the experimental setup. Uh, so Swanand, uh, he and again with the help of uh, Dr. Uh, Subaredi in 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 high voltage uh, engineering, uh, they designed this uh, you know <laughs> huge current source uh, which can pass now four kilo amperes and the pulse duration is can go all the way up to two hundred milliseconds. The one experiment that I was showing you earlier, which was with Dr. Subaredi, the maximum current can go to seven kilo amperes, but the pulse duration was only fifty microseconds. So this has to be redesigned in, in a completely new way. And the experiment he was doing it in this vacuum chamber where the vacuum can go up to 10 to minus 5 uh, millibars uh, with, with, with diffusion pump. And, and the sample, this is his sample. And if I can just uh, maybe let me try to zoom this. Uh, you can see uh, the crack. Uh, uh, here is the crack of, on the sample, right? And then uh, everything else is electrodes uh, that that you already already see, right? And and then the, the, there was a C clamp that was needed, and it served two purposes. First of all, it served the purpose that it was holding the sample, and the second purpose it also uh, served was that it was it we could apply some compressive stresses from the outside, right? So that both purposes was solving. Then you see that we has to put some additional seats here, and these additional seats were put to stop the buckling of this film. Remember that we are looking at uh, a sheet and large compressive stresses are involved here. So if we don't apply this additional constraining sheets, then the whole foil, whole, whole sheet will, will buckle, will buckle out, and then, then we will not be able to uh, do this, um, uh, uh, this process that, that, that well. So here are some results. So this is the initial 40 crack that you can see here. Uh, and then after 10 pulses, the pulse become the, the crack. Uh, it kind of like gets healed, which is more clear as we do the policing. So after policing, uh, 
you can't see the evidence of the crack at all. So the crack is completely gone. And when we do the EBSD map of this, then there is an evidence of crack healing. There is evidence where the crack was. And the evidence is that you can see this region, which has a very different, distinct uh, microstructure, very fine grains, as opposed to every, everywhere else. So, so this, is, this was not there in the beginning. This is where essentially the crack has healed. So we can, by looking at this, we can see that the strategy of uh, taking a smaller cracks, right, smaller cracks, passing the currents with the larger pulse width, while we are applying a little bit of compressive stress, uh, works in healing the crack, right? That's what we are seeing. So the the crack is is healed. Uh, then uh, uh, Swanand also looked into this. Uh, you know, he looked at the spread, uh, the you know, the orientation spread in the in in this in this zone, and these are the reasons which has been healed, right? And we can see that the healed region there is not much misorientation, uh, you know, like intragranular mis misorientation. This kind of suggests that this has been uh, recrystallized grains, as opposed to the grains which are further away from these regions, which have a large misorientation uh, in inside itself. And if you look at like uh, this is a possible uh, uh, process why this thing is happening, uh, we thought that okay perhaps this is a diffusion bonding because there's a compressive stress, there's a very high temperature, and there's not much evidence evidence of melting. So we we looked at this process of diffusion bonding, and these are the four steps that is there in the diffusion bonding. The first is, first step is that because of the compressive stresses, these asperities. You know the two faces come closer, the asperities uh, deform and it becomes flatter. Then we have these voids, and then the voids will start to uh, will white to will 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 shrink, and eventually we have we reach this stage where essentially uh, what we have is there are some cavities or voids which are trapped inside the grains, uh, and the and the boundaries have kind of migrated. As you can see, the grain boundaries have migrated. When we look at this uh, uh, this 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 process on our sample, and by the way, this this is a step where we didn't go for a uh, large enough number of uh, uh, pulses to have the full bonding. We just did it for a few pulses where the bonding was not yet complete. And what we see here is, you know, you can see these micro voids which are there, right? And we can also see that these micro voids actually the grains have migrated, so these voids have now actually become. Uh, a part of these these grains, right? And these different reasons, where we think that uh, diffusion bonding or the process will be faster and short, uh, faster, which is actually happening near the notch region. We can see that uh, these voids are kind of uh, are not that well seen here, right? And even if you see some voids, they are well within the grains, right? So the so so this is this has healed earlier, this has healed later, and we can see the evidence what we see in this schematic. So we think that. Uh, this process is is of diffusion bonding. This is a solid state bonding. There is no liquefaction whatsoever that we see anywhere in this. Next thing we ask the question: How good is the healing? And then Swanan actually did these tests on. Uh, these are actually done by from the many samples. And what we see here is that this 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 line, this red one, is as received material. This one is after just after healing, the blue curve, and the green curve is after healing plus annealing. At you know solutionization actually a treatment that was done, and what we see is when we look at the yield strength, uh, you know, even after healing, it's not you know this is this is this is these are good numbers. There's not much difference even with the with the elongation to failure. This clearly tells that the things have bonded, right? Of course, after annealing, uh, we we have very good improvement even in the ductility, right? And if you look at the fracture surfaces, we can clearly see. The dimples that we have in the healed samples are much smaller, and that is because the grains, uh, grain size, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 okay, one thing is that the fracture actually happens uh, at the same spot where the healing was, healing was taken, healing took place. So, so this fracture is not, uh, and it's kind of certain where it will fracture. It will fracture in the region of, of the healing. So, and this region, we have small grains that I showed you earlier, and hence you have much smaller dimples. So, so, but, but, but the point is, uh, uh, these these results clearly show uh, that healing was there, and healing was uh, pretty good uh, in some sense. So, with to, with that, I would like to summarize my talk. So, so what we see here is that if we have a crack, 
uh, in, a, in, a, in a metallic material, in a conductor, and we pass the electric current. Uh, one possibility is that the crack can uh, propagate uh, quite cleanly, am I right? And that, that is possible when we pass high current density, uh, short pulse width, long crack length, and high conductivity material. The blowholes can also form when the current density is a kind of higher than what is required here. The crack length is very long, much longer than what we, what we require here. And there's a very poor heat dissipation. Uh, this is something that we didn't discuss much. But in some sense, uh, if the heat is not extracted very well, then the temperature of the of the material can go very high, and hence the, it will it will lead to melting. So that's what we see see in the seats, thick seats or plates. Uh, crack propagation is aided by magnetic field, am I right, and mechanical load, and that actually reduces the 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 critical current density that is required for fracture, and that hence lead to a decrease in the heat affected zone or the plastic zone uh, around the crack tip. Uh, if we apply the mechanical load at an angle, it can deflect the crack. We can use the same thing also to heal the crack, as we can see here. And crack healing is 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 possible when we again, of course, we have always have to apply the high current densities, but we have to do large pulse width, a very high pulse width, and we have to have cracks which are still small, not very long cracks. If once the cracks become very long, then I don't, I'm not so sure if it can be healed. And it works very well if the material has low conductivity, like something like stainless steel. Uh, crack healing is aided by, if you apply any compressive stresses, it will help. Uh, and it is a solid state crack healing, and that is due to diffusion bonding. So with that, I, I thank you all for your uh, for your patience and listening to me. So, Thank you, Professor Praveen, for this uh, excellent talk. And I think uh, you have also highlighted one important point that the electric uh, current has to be much higher. I yes. may not have captured the, you know, the what is the quantum of the current that you are talking about. Can you just uh, refresh me with the amount of current that you are talking about in this process? Yeah, so the, the so it's a, it's a good idea to look into the current density. Uh, yeah. The current densities that we are looking at is of the order of 10 to the power 7 to 10 to the power 9 ampere per meter square. So these are very high current densities. Oh, current densities. OK, yeah. no, because I was just looking at from the process of uh, welding. See, normally yes. for weldments, you also use some high currents, something yes. like 100 amperes or even more than that. So can we get a feel for current density to current uh, values conversion so, so, in your yeah. case? So, so here actually the currents that we are looking at is is uh, is way higher than, you know, we are looking at the currents that we have used in our experiments is of the order of a uh, few kilo amperes. Your kilo uh, amperes. Yeah, okay. but but okay. for very short duration, for durations like uh, 50 microseconds and all the way up to few milliseconds, few hundred milliseconds, yeah. Okay, and the voltages are uh, low voltages or? Very low voltages because we are working only yeah. on the metals. So, for yeah. example, the voltages that we will be looking here is of only a few tens of volts, so mm -hmm. not very high voltage. Yeah. Uh, why I'm asking is some of my friends over here, they work on high voltage and then they also use the high voltage to, you know, actually melt the yeah. substrate and then use it for deposition. Yes. So, which so, is also another possibility where, you know, if I want to do the crack filling, I can do that using a high voltage and, uh, you know, short pulse or whatever it is, right? So, so, okay. so melting of the, of, of the crack tip is always a possibility. Right, mm -hmm. but but what happens with when we do the melting, uh, especially uh, if there is any uh, compressive stresses applied, mm -hmm. then that can be an issue with the integrity of the structure itself because the liquid will just True. simply go away from True. it. True. Uh, True. So this one is uh, so because it's a solid state, so you know the integrity mm -hmm. of the structure is is kind of a little little uh, uh, is not that under that severe uh, stress. Mm -hmm. Well, the other important point I noticed that, you know, see, even if we look at it from the viewpoint of fundamentals of fracture mechanics, we are looking at the energy balance, namely the work done minus the strain energy or whatever it is happening over here. So in this case, instead of doing a mechanical work, you are suggesting that you will do a work yeah. by electric field or by a magnetic field yes. or yes. whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah. Good. So there are some questions from the audience. So let me just read it out and you can give your feedback to them. 
So Sundar says that the current field will induce a temperature uh, field. That in turn will induce thermal strain field and its distortion over time by heat transfer. So the consequences to SIF will depend on how the specimen is gripped, whether it is constrained or not. How are these accounted for? That's his question. Yeah, so so the the samples are are, are we grip it in 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 actually in a rather elaborate way uh, perhaps i have uh, uh, ah like this kind of uh, gripping is there so you can see that this is the foil and then we put a substrate at the bottom just to give a support and then we have to you know grip it uh, essentially if you look at it it's gripped at these two locations these two ends okay. and then it's also gripped here because of the electric wires itself Mm -hmm. So this is how we do the, and then it goes into this setup. So this is this is how generally we do the experiments. And what we have done is that we have uh, modeled actually exactly the same thing in the FEM also. So so this is uh, whatever are any effects of um, you know temperature or other things they're all accounted for when we calculate the uh, the J integral and the stress intensity factor. So I, uh, does that does that answer the uh, answer the question? I guess so. So the next one is from uh, Hari. He is asking in the absence of liquid nitrogen, the effect is due to the combined effect of joule heating and electric current. By measuring the temperature history, has there been an attempt to decouple the temperature and the electrical effect? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I wish that I can measure the temperature, uh, but but we we have not been able to do that. The 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 reason is uh, this this whole thing is finished in fifty microseconds or a few milliseconds. Uh, so we have to get some thumb, one of the thermal cameras which can measure that so fast. Mm, and, and yeah, don't yeah. have. I don't think that for the shorter ones, it, even if it can be done. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, uh, something to do it in future. But uh, but we have a uh, 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 you know because when we do this finite element analysis, uh, we can kind of uh, what to say like get get a sense of the temperatures. So when we do these experiments in under under liquid nitrogen, I, we think that the temperature is, doesn't go beyond the room temperature, the actual temperature. Uh, okay. Whereas when we do it at in the room temperature, like in the ambience, then the temperatures may go close to uh, 400 and 500 degrees Celsius for aluminum, which is very high actually. But that region is very small. That region is about only a few few tens of micrometers over which the temperature goes high. Uh, remember that we are doing these experiments on a foil for a reason, mm, mm. Uh, so to minimize the temperature, actually, to to maximize the heat loss. If we do these experiments on a thick sheet, then the temperatures will go very very high, and, and it will become difficult to uh, to to uh, to minimize melting, actually. So okay. so, so yeah. What is the, the order of thickness of this foil? This is, uh, we have done experiments on 10 micro, like 12 micrometers, then 20 micrometers. And now I think uh, Swanand uh, is doing about 50 micrometers thick foil because we haven't been able to do the microstructure of this. <laughs> and oh, okay, they are so, okay, yeah. so now we yeah, are trying yeah. to increase the thickness to 50 micrometers and hopefully we will be able to do some, some, yeah. some, some analysis. Yeah, that is what was striking me, you know, because if you look at the grain size to the thickness, then the yeah. chances are that you know only less. I mean, about a grain is participating yes, yes. in each that of your. Yes, that yeah. is true. That it is only a, a grain that is, or few grains that is participating. So this is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we want to do some uh, fractography. We want to do some uh, you know microstructural analysis around the crack crack mm -hmm. propagation region. So mm -hmm. we are hoping that with 50 micrometers we should be able to gain some some idea about that. Yeah. Does it also mean that the crack path has been kind of a uh, little bit tortuous? No, because it because moves the whole, from... thing is, whole thing stays in one, uh, you know, one grain, let's say, and it just continues to... Uh, we have seen that the cracks are actually not much, uh, you know, like you can see in these images, I can mm -hmm. show you. Okay. Uh, this, this has been very... Uh, Sorry, uh, this is we wanted them to be tortuous, so that's why they are in tortuous. But you can see okay. here, uh, sorry, uh, these images, right? So yeah, yeah, it's not straight, but okay, sure. Okay, well, within the limits of uh, whatever the standards suggest as yes, the yes, deviation. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. The next question is: Does polarity of the current play a role in the crack growth or closure? 
Uh, no, not not that we think of. Not when we are uh, when we have a magnetic field, then yes. Mm -hmm. But when we don't have a magnetic field, then it doesn't. That's what we think. Yeah, we have done experiments with because, as a matter of fact, when we are doing these experiments, when we are applying the magnetic field, then only we realize that the polarity matters. So that means all the experiments that we did before, we didn't mm -hmm. care about where the polarity is, <laughs> okay. and we got all the experiments which were kind of consistent with each other. So mm -hmm. yes. When we have the magnetic field, because you remember the, the polarity will decide what is the current, what is the magnetic field direction, right? And then we are doing the experiments under the external magnetic field. So how they will be added will depend mm. on the polarity. But but mm. other than that, uh, there is no, uh, I don't think there is any effect of polarity. Okay. There's one question from Satyam Suvas. Does the extent of uh, healing depend on the thickness of the sheet or the foils? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, I, at this point of time, I, I don't have a I don't have an answer, but these films that, that the seats that we have healed, uh, they are about uh, 1.25 millimeter thick. I no, I don't know. Uh, I I think I think they are about uh, more than a millimeter. I I don't know whether it's 1.25 or 1.5. So they are they are they are slightly thicker on the uh, on the side. Uh, we we because of the effect of the buckling that we have. Right? Mm -hmm. Uh, we haven't been able to do these experiments on very thin uh, sheets, uh, which we want to do it and see how it becomes a very thin sheets or or thicker one. I think we we should be able to do. It's not very difficult. But then thicker ones actually, the 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 machine that we have. You remember mm -hmm. that we were trying to look for one current density. Mm -hmm. So if you want to reach to that current density and if you have a thicker film, thicker sheets, let's say, mm -hmm. then the the current that we have to pass becomes very high. Yeah. And that capacity we don't have. Okay. But in principle, I think it should be easier to do on a thicker film in some sense, because the temperature can re easily rise to, to, a, mm. to a large value, to a higher value. And, and that's because you have a stainless steel whose specific resistivity is high. Very high, yes. So yeah. so we, right. we could not do these experiments yet on, on, on aluminum because mm. it doesn't, uh, the, 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 there's no temperature gradient. The compressive mm -hmm. stress that is built is very little. So we just get the fraction. Yeah. Okay. The other question from Satyam is uh, Suhas is that what is driving force for dynamic recrystallization observed in the heat oh, crack? Yeah. So because there is a lot of uh, uh, plastic strain that is being generated there, uh, and and that's what we think is is responsible for the recrystallization. Remember that this is uh, sitting at high temperature, but at the same time uh, there is large compressive stresses that is that is being generated there. So that's 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 what we think. Uh, uh, yeah. Then there is uh, one question from the guest who says who is asking. In the initial part of the talk, you had mentioned regarding the current traveling in the opposite direction after some time interval, uh, within brackets on account of the magnetic field. So may you please elaborate on how that happens. So this is the uh, you know the interplay between the, the the classical Faraday's law, right? And and so what it suggests is that if you change electric field, then the magnetic field will be produced, and if you change the magnetic field, then the electric field will be in, induced, right? So this is so when we are passing the current pulse, right? There is a large change in the electric field in the beginning because we are passing the square pulse. So so change in the electric field is very rapid. That leads to a change in the that leads to a production of or generation of the magnetic field, but the magnetic field is also changing mm -hmm. because the electric field is changing. So, because if you have a change in the magnetic field, that will then induce the current, right? So, so, so essentially, the so so the material is resisting that that injection of the current. In other words, mm -hmm. and 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 to and and that it is doing by increasing or enhancing this uh, this eddy currents, right? So the so the net net current that is actually flowing through the material is much smaller than what you are trying to pass. Mm. Uh, but with time, once we reach that steady state of in the current, what we are trying to pass from the outside, then the change in the external electric field reduces. That then mm. reduces the change in the magnetic field, mm. and hence uh, the 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 eddy currents or or the induced current reduces, and then we have the what we pass. So that is because of the very rapid increase in the current. Yeah. So. Yeah. Then there is also a follow up question regarding the direction of crack propagation. Doesn't crack propagation, the direction, depend on the grain structure of the material? This is aside from the external factors which you can control. 
from yeah. the so, mechanical point of view, cracks will generally propagate along the grain boundaries. That is what he says. So, so yeah. we are we are we are here. All our discussion is has been in the continuum continuum realm. So the grains, the cracks that we are looking at are fairly long. So they themselves have such a driving force that they can you know overcome this. Uh, you know the the issues with uh, what is associated with the metallurgical issue conditions like let's say grain boundaries or or I, I'm so sure that they, they they are they are playing some role, but but most probably not dominant. Yeah. Is that, is, yeah. There's one more question from Neeraj Mohan, who is asking wonderful and who is saying wonderful and insightful talk. I have the following questions: Are these measurements made in plain strain condition? So this will be in mostly in plain stress because these are very. We are looking at something yeah. thinner, very thin, fairly thin. What exactly is the current density doing for closing cracks? Does it change diffusivity or enhance dislocation uh, activities? That's what yeah, he wants to know. That is that is a very fantastic. That is a really nice question, and we are we are now uh, Swanam is trying to do some calculations uh, because uh, the the thing that I discussed is just uh, you know. That okay, we close it and it's a diffusion bonded like a solid state bonding. Uh, the the question that we have to we are asking now is uh, what is the diffusion length, uh, right? Uh, second question is that now we are passing electric current and this goes to what Professor Thames was asking. You know, we because of the electric current, we, if we have electroplasticity, that will enhance or that will affect the dislocation activity. That can then affect the crystallization process, recrystallization process. And then, of course, we also have this uh, classical question of uh, electro migration that can also lead to a diffusion of the material. So, so what are the uh, what is the relative role of these? And and is what is electric current? Uh, these are like let's say that if I call diffusion bonding or the temperature rise and the compressive stresses as a direct effect of electric current that we can capture here in our models, uh, FEM models. Mm -hmm. uh, the other two. Like, like the effect of electric current on on on, on diffusivity uh, or or the dislocation motion dislocation uh, this is something that is not captured in these models so so those are the things that we are uh, right now we are uh, looking at we are doing some calculations like some backup envelope calculations and to just get an order of order of magnitude uh, correlations uh, to see whether they are important or not so so as of now uh, I, I, I'm not too sure what, what are the many things that electric current is doing, but but this is what we are seeing. The, 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 the thing is bonded uh, in, in, in solid state. Yeah. Then he's uh, asking in your sustained curve, the heated sample shows a higher yield strength. Any reasons for this? Yeah, that is, uh, 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 I can speculate that, you know, of course there is a uh, sample to sample variation, but there's also, you remember that the, uh, the grains there are actually small, and mm. and they're also uh, the density of the dislocations that we see uh, around this region because of the plastic uh, plastic uh, 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 plastic work or, or the cold work uh, has is actually a little higher. So 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 that that may be uh, responsible for an enhanced yield strength uh, of the of the healed material because the grains there are small and there is large amount of uh, plastic strain uh, during the process, uh, but which kind of then disappears once we anneal it. Uh, so, so, so that's 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 what we think. Good. Uh, I think there are no more questions from the audience, but I just want to ask you: Does this kind of you know your uh, what do you call crack healing that what you are talking about uh, also help us to? Look at uh, dissimilar materials. If supposing, you know, let's assume that I have two dissimilar materials and I have the electric current passed like the way you have mentioned. Does it help me to join them? My my first uh, answer will be yes. We we should be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we we uh, of course the uh, we we you see the interfaces are always a, uh, are the places of high temperatures because mm -hmm. of high resistance. The temperatures are, are are there. Whether we are applying enough, can we generate enough compressive stresses to actually, uh, you know, bond them, right? Mm. So, so that's that's really where it boils down to. But but Let, let's let's imagine that you know I do the I do the friction uh, welding. What do you call? You yes. know, yeah. plus I also couple it with my current electric uh, field. Uh, 
yes. then uh, the possibility that it can be an enhanced uh, activity uh, yes. i mean seems to be you know my line of thinking so yes. do you do you have any comments on that i, I think uh, we should get some good results there i'm, yeah. I'm very positive about it but that's a nice idea we, we didn't think about along that line like Gibson star and this but that is something, of course, uh, worth exploring. No, not, I, 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 yeah, I didn't mention friction stirred, but I thought it is friction. <laughs> value, no, but yeah. but I, I get your point. I think there yeah. is something certainly is uh, worth exploring. Yeah. I, okay. I think uh, something nice will come out, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as what I told you in the beginning, I think there is a lot of, uh, you know, practical applications, especially electroplasticity and uh, use yeah. of electricity for enhancing your processing of Forming and other things. So yeah. I see that you know your uh, work helps us to move more into those uh, domains. So I think if there are no more questions from the audience, I thank uh, the speaker, Professor Praveen Kumar, for having given an excellent uh, lecture. And uh, I also thank him on behalf of the Indian Structural Integrity Society and then the Center for Safety Critical Systems, IIT Madras. I thank all the audience who are present over here for having uh, participated and also raised some very good questions and I've had a good interaction with the speaker. So with this, uh, I will kind of conclude this uh, uh, webinar and uh, thank once again, Professor Praveen Kumar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chandan. Is he controlling the recording? Darshan, Darshan. Darshan, can you just stop the recording?